Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The 20th of July is in modern history a very important date for mankind. We were all reminded of this when Neil Armstrong recently died because it was 33 years before when he immortalised for mankind those words, one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. Only 25 years before Armstrong landed on the moon, the Second World War would have been shortened had the attempt on Hitler's life by being successful when a number of German generals tried to assassinate him also on the 20th of July, but in 1944. Only 10 short years before that, on the 20th of July 1934, the most important event of my life happened when the stork, as was the fashion in those days, delivered me to a house by the River Elbe in Hamburg. Six weeks later, my mother, have you got a slide? Come on. You're supposed to be organised. You've got a copy of this. <laughs> You're with me now. Thank you very much. Um, my mother, a German expressionist painter who'd studied art in Berlin, and my father, an industrial organic chemist, my brother and I left Nazi Germany for a holiday to the Netherlands, never to return until many years later. As a family, we spent most of the next few years living in England at Thorpe Bay on the Thames estuary before emigrating to WA in February 1938, one of the original boat people, if I might add. To speak about my emotional connection with the Swan River, living on the Netherlands foreshore brings back many happy memories. Right through the childhood, to leaving Perth in 1956, to develop virgin bush on the Esperance sand plain. To understand what a huge impact the river had on my childhood, I need to give you a quick snapshot of metropolitan Perth with 200,000 inhabitants, which was the number before the war, as the same number after the war. The river was the only place to swim with baths at Crawley, Claremont and Nedlands for shark protection and for flat water. It was a time when horses still played an important role in the community with horse-drawn carts delivering milk, bread, vegetables and ice for the ice boxes to keep food cold before refrigerators became affordable. There were dunnies in the backyard and a copper was not only a policeman but a vessel to be heated for boiling your clothes. It was time when teachers, doctors, priests, bank managers, lawyers and elected members of Government were respected and valued <laughs> members of society and held up as role models. Christian religious beliefs dominated much of the community with families being the cornerstone of society with a low divorce rate. Socially, it was taboo to talk about sex, politics and religion and wealth even. I grew up in a time when petrol, food and clothing were all being rationed. It was a time when our leaders believed that we must populate or perish, but with an absolute limit of 20 million people, which could be sustained in the driest continent on Earth. The river had a profound effect not just on me, but my whole family, who, to be honest, were an anomaly in this part of town. Mother, in particular, felt isolated both physically and culturally from her German homeland and sought solace in painting the surrounds as viewed from her upstairs studio. Thank you. Lying between our house and the river was my favourite tree, an extraordinary large melaleuca which I regularly climbed using foot and handholds that I had made with an axe. It also captured my mother's imagination. She painted it many times with many moods that she would see. It saddens me to see that in recent years this once very healthy tree appears to be dying. Beyond the immediate environs of the house, there was much to explore from Pelican Point to Point Resolution. Many a day, particularly in winter, I would ride my horse along the river to have a warm swim in the hot pool fed by an artesian spring located below the cliffs of Sunset Hospital. I kept my horse major on half an acre of 
nearby on the avenue and would ride him at least four times a week. I used to ride through Kings Park out to Perry Lakes and occasionally I would follow the river upstream and go as far as Coosbury Hill or Darlington where I could leave him with friends until the next weekend. He would, if I was riding pear pack, think it was good fun to buck me off when he got on firm ground after heavy going on soft river sand. Always accompanied uh, us uh, trotting alongside would be Thomas, my Alsatian Border Collie cross dog. He's there? Good. Um, <laughs> the river provided more than just a, a playground with plenty of food to be harvested. I caught crabs and with drop net scoops and with bare hands diving on them from behind. Female crabs were always returned. I used to be paid threepence for a large blue manor and a penny for a small one from the, the local fish shop. Female crabs, of course, were always returned. I would gidgey cobblers or carly, other fish in shallow water, all of which were plentiful and provided good eating. But I could also buy fish from a number of professional fishermen who would ply the river in small, open, clinker-built boats. The local burglar showed me how to catch prawns in the day, for he was very busy at night. <laughs> you, 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 you looked for sandy patches in large areas of weed and then simply ran your hands through the sand and picked up prawns by the dozen. My introduction to sailing started on the Swan as a bowler boy on 16-foot skiffs out of Mounts Bay Sailing Club. In those days, these open wooden boats were crewed by five men and a nimble young boy was needed to use a wooden shovel-like scoop to bail out the water in between the two ribs of the boat. My first boat was a balsa wood framed canvas covered sailing canoe which was given to me one Christmas. I only had one sail in it out of Freshwater Bay before it was stolen and wrecked near Point Walter. But it did give me a start that most boys could only dream about as they wistfully watched the, the yachts on the swan. From this... Psst. <laughs> From this beginning, an endless mucking around on homemade canoes, I developed a lifelong sailing affair with yachts of all shapes and sizes. A boat builder along the avenue used to chop down trees along the esplanade and in front of our house and use the timber for keels, kiltsons, stems and knees for all sorts of craft. From a shed near to his house, there was a slipway straight into the river to launch the yachts that he built. After school, I would sit fascinated as I watched him create boats like raters and semi-raters, which was uh, similar to uh, present-day cooter boats that seemed to be the fashion. During the Second World War, the only link to the outside world was Qantas Catalinas, painted black, based in front of our house. They took off from Melville Water and anchored not far offshore, close enough for me to swim to. A slipway by the car park off Hacker Drive was built on land out uh, to haul out the Catalinas when they needed servicing and a hangar on the foreshore. It was all so exciting and part of a great learning experience for a child to see these great big cumbersome flying boats take off and land and marvel at their ability to take off from water. On the east side of the Qantas base was a barbed wire fence guarded by Australian soldiers to protect both the Dutch and American Catalinas bases uh, fronted Matilda Bay. Very occasionally the guards would let me and another schoolboy whose father was the caretaker, caretaker come ranger for the Matilda Bay and Pelican Point area slip through the fence. There were great places to build cubbies along the river, mainly dug into the ground and camouflaged. One of these was not far from our house and comprised a tunnel leading to another chamber covered by tin and logs and soil. We collected all sorts of stuff, including debris from a Catalina that had crashed nearby. The cubby had a trans uh, sorry, had a trapdoor um, known only to we three who built it. One day, another lad followed us and wanted to join our little gang. He offered us chocolate, Coca-Cola and cigarettes, which were all rationed and in short supply. All these were impossible to obtain except on the black market. My father one day came down, as he probably noticed some smoke coming through a little <laughs> exhaust hole, and sprung us. And the next thing, of course, he worked out that it was the boy's uncle who was the black marketer, 
which put an end to our living on contraband. <laughs> the Swan River and its foreshore, relatively free of pollutants, was a wonderful playground and crystallised many of my emotions. Playing cowboys and Indians, using gings and bows and arrows, huge bonfires on Guy Fox night, and all sorts of adventures were all part of my childhood along the river, with freedom from regulations, whilst my childhood pranks and misdemeanours were punished, would you believe, with common sense. Port, come on, got the next one. Oh, God, she's up with it this time. As a child, one took all this for granted, and it's only with the benefit of hindsight that the adult realises what a privilege it was to grow up on the banks of the swan and all that it provided. It made me content, happy, and gave solace, free of constraints and judgment to a growing boy, keeping in check all the emotions coupled with adolescence. My life on the swan, from selling crabs, exploring uh, on my horse, swimming to sailing, to the people that led me to meet, all assisted me from an early age to understand the power of observation, the importance of collecting relevant information, collating it, and finally coming to a conclusion on which to base decisions. This has stood me in good stead in everything I have done in the rest of my life. To the Swan River, I give my thanks, and I hope fervently that my grandchildren will be able to say the same. <laughs>